we should be live. Uh, good morning or good evening, depending on where on the globe you are currently standing. <laughs> Welcome to a special edition of Branch of Laurels. I'm Ashaxi from Ontier, and I interview uh, laurels from around the world. And today I have with me uh, Magistra Ari Mala from Dragon Vault. And uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, joining me this morning, this evening for you. <laughs> um, I like to start these off uh, by asking what your SCA origin story is. How did you find the SCA and what made you fall in love with it? When I was 16, so about 150 years ago, um, my mother's colleague at uh, an American university who was a medievalist was talking to her and said, there's this event that I think your daughter would really enjoy. And uh, I'll be there, you know, I can, I can chaperone her and that sort of thing. And so I went to that event, which was a feast of simple fare held by a cook known then as Baron Salamullah the Corpulent. And there were approximately a hundred dishes and nobody ever told me that I'd need my own plates or anything. So oh. I, I was on I was on church plates because it was held in a church hall. Um, and by the end of the evening, I had enacted the great baklava scam. Um, so that really, that should have told me the way, the way my career was going to go. But back then I was just a sort of innocent 16 year old um, who liked baklava a lot sort of the other people at my table, uh, hence the baklava scam. <laughs> did you uh, did you worm your way into getting more for your table? Is that what happened? Yes, basically a lot of us were using the plain white ch church plates and it was a long table. So the server stood at the end and put a piece of baklava on the plates. And as it, mine finally got back to me, I just sort of passed it up, uh, scraped it off, put it next to my eating plate and sent it up again. And gradually the entire table came into the scam and the people with really obvious plates took them and put them in front of them. Um, but all of us, about eight of us, with the plain white plates just circulated them and circulated them and circulated them. <laughs> Eventually I was leaning like this to hide the pile of baklava behind me. <laughs> and um, we didn't eat any until we knew that there had been enough to go around, but there was a great hue and cry that came up saying, there has been a miracle! There is enough baklava so that each person may have one piece. <laughs> and then we, you know, noshed down on our five or six pieces each and everything was fine. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, so where did you go from there what um what was your I play, next i played a i played a little while when i was in university but i started playing most when i emigrated and started doing my ma and phd at the university of wales i'm a founding member of the welsh shire Munith Gwyn, and i was in north wales and everybody else was in south wales and you can't get from north to south wales without going via england um, cause the roads are just not great, but you know, I was in my twenties, I was pretty much immortal. So I would drive down for events and things like that. Or, you know, sometimes I even day trip to Aberdeen, which is a, about 10 to 12 drive, hour drive each way. Wow. <laughs> That's quite a day trip. Um, why, why oh. did you, what, what made you cho choose to go to Wales? A friend had uh, moved there for his PhD in mathematics and he wrote me a letter. As I said, it's 150 years ago. He wrote me a letter saying, I have a spare room. Why don't you move in? <laughs> so I did. <laughs> and, and don't regret a bit of it. No, not a bit of it. I spent about a decade doing the two degrees in Wales. I love it. I was five five minutes from the mountains and I was right on the sea on Anglesey, which is the island to the north of Wales. You can go to a place called Shigui, which is a place where there is a Saxon settlement, a Neolithic burial tomb and a 15th century chapel within spitting distance of each other. 
Wow. And a good beach too. Wow. Um, so did you, you had a, an interest in history before you found the SCA? Yes. I was fortunate that I had very, a very, very good tutor in uh, high school. Sorry, trying to remember my North American. Um, in high school, and I, the only thing that I, I got turned off, as it were, was chemistry because the teacher wasn't as good as she could have been. Mm. Um, so as you started in the SCA, um, what were your first interests? What, what were the first things that you liked to do? Archery. Oh. And then Mistress Doran of Ashwell was my first laurel and she got me started in doing calligraphy and illumination. And I was working for Atlantia because when I first worked for Atlantia, there were two or 300 backlog. And then I went away for a bit. I was doing other participatory things that weren't, that weren't SBA, SCA, sorry. And when I came back, Atlantia had in its infinite wisdom added about 12 awards and their backlog was 500 or 600. Oh so oh if you are a beginning scribe out there, Work for Atlantia. They will never not have work for you. <laughs> um, so a lot of your early work was for Atlantia. Um, and Correct. that Laurel was in, in Atlantia? No, the Mr. Storm of, of Ashwell was in East. I started off in the north in the northeast New England. Okay. And um, did you play in Atlantia or did you just no. make scrolls no. to them? I've never even attended an event in Atlantia. You just did a lot of their scrolls. <laughs> yes, and it was all backlog. So. Wow. 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 Well, I wonder if they've used uh, this COVID time to uh, catch up on their backlog. I know that, that would be have, good. Yeah, we have in our kingdom, our scribes have been working really hard, which has been. Um, we didn't used to have any backlog here because I cleared it all. Um, but things happen. So when you moved to um, Wales, did you find a new mentor? Not for a very long time. I just sort of moved my, my laptop and worked on my desk and did one every so often. Um, again, there was I didn't have email yet, so any assignments came to me through the post and generally one at a time. So I wouldn't be doing big batches. Today I have a tendency when I do blanks to do big batches. So um, small scraps of vellum about yay big um, are easily come by in Drachenwald. So I do a lot of blanks that are tiny, but nicely illuminated so that uh, impulse scrolls can be filled out on site. And they don't create a future backlog. They don't create backlog and they look nice and they're on vellum. Which is a very rare thing for us here in the States because it's expensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, a lot of vellum, there's a lot of vellum made by Federigoni in Italy and some also in Germany. And these places sell their scraps, which they cut down to squares. And since they're selling them as, as scraps, they're, they're sold by weight and they're relatively inexpensive. So I just got a couple of kilos of scraps. And some of them aren't, aren't good enough because it's all different levels of quality, but some of them are lovely. And I just, you know, sand them, not sand. I pounce them down and people get vellum scrolls. So exciting. So you said that you founded um, your local, uh, is it a barony or is it a um, shire? No, we only have one barony in the principality and it only just went barony. It was the Shire of Money's Gwyn, the Shire of White Mountain, which is all of Wales. And then I moved into England. So they, to, to keep the five member minimum, they sort of annexed part of England as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it always happened in the reverse way, but why not this way? And since it was before email and, and the internet, really, how did you do that? How did you... Um, I, got, I, got, I got emailed during, um, during, the, during the time I was in North Wales, and then I started corresponding that way. But phone, we used the phone. 
Wow. And wow. I sent out physical commenting letters when I was Herald in Chief. It's uh, it's so different than how we run things now. People are um, so uh, have become so accustomed to immediate uh, communication and immediate um, recognition, and that's so different because it's a phone call or it's waiting weeks for letters or. Online resources again. Um, when I was in England, I stopped playing to play some other things for a while. And when I got back, all the manuscripts were online. And I didn't need necessarily the two shelves of really big, heavy books that I'd been carefully amassing for decades. <laughs> this is my 38th year in society, by the way. So that's a, that's a long, healthy run. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so you also are a, a voice herald. How did you get into doing that? I'm very loud and I have stage training and I have improv training. So all of those, the first time I heralded though, the first time I heralded was a nightmare. Um, I was the principal herald for the, for the principality. And I went to an event and I brought see people from Wales with me. So I was supposed to be babysitting them. Um, and then the King and Queen said, well, where's the Harold? And they roped me in. And before this, I had been, I changed my persona when I came to Drakenwald because I was, uh, they outlawed my old persona in East. And um, when, I, when I got here, they, I just didn't do any courts. And in, in the East, what I had normally done, because I was playing a very sort of laid back, sardonic uh, pirate, essentially 13th century pirate, I had um, mainly sat in the back of court and made snide remarks to make people laugh because the courts were three, four hours long. In Drachenwald, I have seen a three hour court, but it had three sets of royals at it. Normally they're under an hour. Oh, that would be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. yes, and I had never seen a court that wasn't three hours long and I had no idea what I was doing and I did it very badly. So 20 years later, I was, I was dragged back into it again and I had more confidence. And uh, you just can't stop me now. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, you did eventually find a mentor. I did. And, and who was that? And how did that relationship come about? Melissa Fitzwalter. I wanted to be her apprentice, but she thought it would be better if I were a student. And she doesn't live in the same country. Um, she did for a while, but she lives in Ireland. So we'd get together only at events and she'd give me feedback or I'd send her photos and she'd give me feedback. And I used to run a scriptorium in Oxford I live in Oxford and I used to run a scriptorium again slumming it it was a Jacobean it was a Jacobean building um, but yes I'd run that once a year and you know I draw people from several different countries so it was very gratifying we had a parliament there one year um, what's a parliament uh, a parliament a courier a courier but for the prince and princess is generally called a parliament here um, how is it different going from having a feast at maybe a local Masonic hall and, and uh, you know, the, the local sheep uh, pasture to <laughs> having <laughs> events in, in a having a feast in Castle? Castle. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's probably easiest. I know you, you've introduced you, Dame Leonette, so she may have have said this but when her kids were young they'd fall asleep on the way to an event and she'd carry them in and they'd wake up in a castle so it was all magic and that's really the way it is it's magic we're fortunate to have Kerfili, to have raglan um to have Ingus industry hall sorry somebody's just rung the doorbell i'm just going to tell them i'm busy <laughs> no worries <laughs> I think that's a first. That's that's awesome. Um, 
So she's answering the door and she will be back shortly. No problem. I do apologize for that. That was a delivery person. He's only five hours late. Oh. <laughs> You're supposed oh. to be here at noon. I'm glad you've got your package. <laughs> <laughs> so we were um, talking about atmosphere and um, do, is it easier to, to kind of lose yourself in the event and in, in the magic of everything because you're in a period setting? Definitely. Oh, definitely. Um, and also because, I mean, I'm sure you, you were going to come around with it, with SCA Drachenwald, we're a small kingdom, and the SCA is family. The SCA is my chosen family. Since I emigrated from the States, all my family are back in the States. So these are, this is my support group. These are the people who keep me going. And then at Raglan, Raglan Castle is special. One of my photographs of Raglan Castle was on the cover of Tournaments Illuminated. And you could see the, the front gate of Raglan reflected in the moat. Yes, when we have bridge battles, we use a bridge <laughs> over a moat. Um, and when we're there, that's home to the extent that I could use it in a quiz or a crossword, something like that. Uh, the clue was Raglan. It was a four letter word. Everybody put home. And wow. that's, you know, these places are home for us. That's magical. Um, so you've been playing for 38 years. How long were you playing before you were recognized as a Laurel? 35. 35. So it's been pretty recent. Yes. And it was done at Raglan. So my vigil was in a 15th century room. Oh, you poor thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, you have told me that your laurel is for raising evil to an art form. Can you explain that? Is it just? Yes, that, that, it's a bit of a story. So I'm going to slip into raconteur mode now. Excellent. Um, once upon a time, I went away from the SCA, as I've mentioned, to do other pursuits, which were equally frivolous. And I came back, and the woman who was signet was called Argantui Verkadvile, and I was Argantrod, and I hadn't registered the name because Harpy and I had just had it devolved to an argument of two people with PhDs, one saying, this is a divine name, and one saying, this isn't, look at the cop grammar. And, you know, so I, I was still at Ariane Rod, but nothing was registered. And she was signet, and she had long, dark hair, and she wore round glasses, I believe, at the time. And she did calligraphy and illumination, and she was a herald, and she did archery. And people could not tell the difference between Ariane Hui and Ariane Hrod. Then once upon a time, when I was a Lieutenant General of Archery, I created a round, for, four royal rounds, that also had black hearts on the target. And this is called the Blaggard Shoot. And you got a point of dishonor if you hit a black heart. Mm. The black hearts were all in the high scoring areas of the target. Now I was marshalling this and being a mild mannered, innocent Welsh woman, I was not going to betray my honor by taking part in this. However, my um, Ariantwi came up and said, I wish to shoot in the blackguard shoot. There was a problem with this. She was queen. So I could not let the queen dishonor herself. So I shot in the contest and I won by a factor of two, but that's irrelevant. And then when court came up and, and I announced the results, I did, and in all seriousness, I meant it. I offered to lay down the arms that had been granted me by Matthew and Anna because I had dishonored them. And the crown said, no, no, we think you can keep it. That's fine. And I said, oh, evil pays they're going to and so since another court they couldn't tell us apart we just decided we were twins 
And now even my twin can't tell us apart. For example, she was talking to her husband and her husband said, Ari's looking for you. And my twin, who is also called Ari, but with a Y, said, really, which Ari? <laughs> and her husband kind of looked at her. She claims alcohol was not involved. She's a philosopher. She claims it was a moment of existential dread. <laughs> So she gets to be the good Ari and you get to be the evil Ari. Yes. So Ari Geminamala means Ari the evil twin. And she is Ari Geminabona. So Ari the good twin. And you know, she's she has been fruitful and multiplied. I have a perfectly delightful niece. Um, and I'm the one who you can't see it, but I'm I'm cross-laced because of course evil. And um, I want to be made, I, I do have a consort who will one day make me prin princess so that I can be a vice countess or, a ca or, or queen or countess of vice, either of those is fine. <laughs> um, how, how, what are other ways that you express your evilness? Um, I'm a spy. I have been the signet, both of principality and kingdom. And even when I haven't been, which is, very little time. I, I've never been more than eight months without, <laughs> without an office, actually. Um, so even when I'm not involved in the signet, as, as signet, people hire me to spy on people and uh, innocently inquire how they actually spell and pronounce their names um, and what their favorite color is. And you should really register some heraldry. Um, and th and things like that. Um, also, in reality, I'm heat intolerant. It's part of my disability. Completely heat intolerant, like high 70s and I'm blotto. I'm just completely out. And so I once walked into the Great Hall, 15th century Great Hall at Buckton Towers. And I walked in and they had lit the fire and I walked out because I knew I wasn't going to be able to eat in a hall full of 70, 100 people with them amping up the heat that the fire and the, and the you know, two meter thick walls already had. So I moved across into the uh, merely Victorian house on the site. And then there was a tradition that started after it had been done two or three times, of course, where that was called low hall. And we dance on tables in low hall, we're loud, we're raucous. Um, I have known to be institute a hat tax from anyone who comes into the room. At one point I was wearing about 12 hats. Um, it was occasionally people got rebates, but they didn't necessarily get the same hat back. Um, <laughs> and so, yes, it's a, den, it's, a, it's a den of iniquity and thieves. Um, and apparently duchess and duchesses these days. But yes, low hall was a, for, for us who were not morally upright enough to be seated in the great hall with the king and queen and prince and princess. Um, you also do um, brewing. What, what kind of uh, things do you like to brew? Um, I make liqueurs. And I scrump, uh, which means I go out and I forage for, uh, occasionally in people's front yards because there's only one quince tree around here. Um, I, I scrump the fruit and then I make it into infusions. Um, I cannot make anything with yeast because I'm teetotal. Again, it's part of my disability. I can't have any alcohol. I can't even have vinegar. Um, and I make the, 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 my brews can't go off. They can go badly, but they can't go off. And beers and wines can go off. And since I can't taste them, I don't know. Oh, okay. I know that's what students are for, but still, you know, I don't want to have to go into city center. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you talked earlier about um, doing bardic arts and poetry. Is that something that you uh, started before you were in the SCA? Yes, I've been, I've been writing uh, since I was five. <laughs> um, 
there is an American children's journal called Highlights. I don't know if it's still going. You know it. I, I know it. I grew up reading it. Yes. I wrote a story when I was five about rabbits and my mother insisted on sending it to highlights. And so my first rejection letter was at the age of five. Oh. And I just, I just never stopped. Um, I am now a poet more than a storyteller, but I have five books out of poetry. Oh, wow. um, I've won awards and all sorts. So yes, I can sonnet. I'm not, I'm not the best sonneteer in the kingdom but I can sonnet um, and I'm thinking if I have long COVID and if it ever lets me be normal again, even as normal as I used to be, then I'm going to start up a journal for, um, for medieval poetry in modern English, not an SCA journal and just a, a plain old journal. So <laughs> sonnets and triolets and rondos and ballads and all that sort of thing. What is your favorite um, form uh, in period? For, for in period, it would be a sonnet. I don't get on very well with triolets at all. But I was also, when I was in university, a semi-professional mime. So I have a soft spot for commedia as well. Awesome. Um, how, how does the miming uh, translate into the SCA for you? First of all, uh, it told me a lot about body language. So for example, if I'm sort of projecting in court as Harold, I'm also projecting myself, I'm bolt upright. Um, and then when I couldn't stand, I can't stand for long periods anymore. Then I realized the really easy way to take the focus off the herald and put it on the monarchs is to sit down. They know the herald is not on stage at that point. When I stand up, the herald's on stage, they look at me. When I sit down, they look at the royals and it's a very, very good visual cue. And I change my body language as well. Um, also in the Commedia, just the, the postures that I know these postures and I have the muscle control that I can get, it, I can do the postures with where Fido may just have a lot of, you know, short muscle uh, fibers as, and not the long muscle fibers I have. Right. Um, almost like dancing muscles. It, yes. I used to be a dancer. I danced for many years, but then again, you know, disability, all that happens. So. Um, so how has uh, your disability affected your ability to play in the SCA? Um, has, it, has it changed your game? It has changed my game. Um, I, have, I have dietary requests that could actually kill me. I have the heat intolerance that I mentioned. I can't have any alcohol. Uh, I can't have any vinegar and the insular draconis people who cook for me are brilliant. They make sure there's at least one dish I can have in each course. Um, but there are lots of different, lots of different dietary requirements in the principality. We have people who are allergic to oranges. We have people who are you know, literally deathly allergic to oranges, to lavender, all sorts. Um, so that that's always one thing that has to be thought of right. if people are providing food. Now we're not providing food for anybody for any event that's going to be providing food in a hall for four hundred people. We're just not that size of a kingdom. So they do they do really good jobs with our smaller feasts, which are only 120, 100. 150 max. Also, I have a, a seat that I use for archery. And this seat I got particularly because it is much higher than your standard Savonarola. A Savonarola is quite a low, I have, I'm, I have long legs, I'm entirely made of legs. <laughs> so when I sit down, I'm very short, and it's harder for me to get back up again. 
So this one is about four or five inches higher than a Savonarola chair, and it's very broad. I didn't make it, I just happened across it at a reenactment fair. And I sit doing archery, and on bad days, people collect my arrows for me and tell me what I have or haven't scored. Usually haven't these days because I haven't been practicing. But. And when you herald, you also have used the same chair? Exactly, yes. I carry my... I carry my chair around, or rather I carry my chair around until somebody sees that I'm carrying my chair around, at which point I'm yelled at and the chair taken off me. <laughs> um, does it affect your ability to, um, we like to joke that, that the SCA, the real hobby is moving house because you're packing up everything and, and uh, setting up your house every weekend. Is that becoming a problem for you as well? It is. Um, I have had people help me load and unload the car. And I always have people help me put up my tent. Um, and there are hacks I've developed. For example, I don't sleep on a single air mattress. I sleep on a double high, double air mattress. So it's nearly as tall as my bed at home. I use sheets and blankets. I don't use sleeping bags or anything like that. Since the one time I was at Raglan, and it hit 35 and I woke up literally in a lake with my sleeping bag stuck to me. And that was like, nope, nope, sheets and blankets now. For sure. Um, for sure. Um, clean shifts every day. Anything that can really adjust your mood, make you feel just that little bit less slimy than when you're not going to have a shower for 10 days. <laughs> <laughs> what, um, what things do you think the SCA could change to accommodate um, your needs better? It's hard and it's harder in Drachenwald than in, the, in, than in North America because in Drachenwald we are using period sites and adulterating period sites for accessibility is, let us just say, fraught. Right. But in the event you can't get a period site, making sure that everyone can access it, whether in wheelchair or anything. Um, I've, I've always been really good. There's one Ingest, industry hall has a mezzanine that they built to accommodate the disabled and it has disabled uh, ensuite rooms. Um, there are a group of about five differently abled women that I tend to room with and we're called the naughty room um, because we're all we're all women of a certain age who like to sleep with the windows open in the dead of winter um, I, I understand that feeling <laughs> <laughs> indeed yes my persona is a woman of a certain age and uncertain antecedents so <laughs> Well, um, we have some photos, so why don't we take a look at those and we can talk more about them. This is me running around in my underwear in 90 degree weather on the evening of my laureling. My twin being the good twin was actually, no, it's, I think it's the evening after my laureling. My twin was also laureled on the same day so that we hold the same precedence, but she was laureled in the sunlight being the good twin, and I was laureled by torchlight in the darkness being the bad twin. In Drachenwald, that cloak, and you can just about see behind the, the uh, liqueur I'm holding, there is a pearl, a pearl necklace with a laurel on it. Oh, um, Those are handed down from one laurel to the next. So the most recent laurel always has the cloak, unless somebody has made them one, of course, and the, the pendant. The pendant was the pendant that um, the woman who is now Nadezhda Taronova um, had on her laureling. She was the first princess of Insula Draconis. So we've handed that down and it keeps going and it is handed down to the next laurel. Um, so my, my twin got to wear it for approximately eight hours and she handed it to me with the with the wish that I would be able to wear it for a, a good period longer. 
<laughs> I gave it to Edith, I believe, and I believe you've also interviewed Edith. This, I love, this is my favorite manuscript ever. I love grotesques. I love things that are naughty. And this was told to me with very little, to, with not a lot of notice. And I was told, make it colorful. So I made it orange and blue because it's a very medieval color palette that you don't often see in, mod in modern times. And it was for a wonderful woman. There is a little, there is a little martlet in the center of the, of the gold at the bottom and that's the badge of the order. And it's very heavily abbreviated because I'm a paleographer who believes in just changing the words to fit the lines. And it's also in, it's also not in modern English. I don't work in modern English. Which is really good, actually, because it means you can change the spelling of a word to suit its space. <laughs> Whereas if you use modern English, you're just kind of out of luck if you don't have the right space for your word. This is Low Hall. That is a picture of a rake and a reprobate. And I will leave you to guess which one of the two of us is which. I was cross-dressing this evening. Oh, that's Ot Otter. Uh, he is a, an well-traveled otter who has an eye for the women and who travels the world, getting pictures taken of him and he has a, you know, he has a site where all of the pictures are posted. So yes, that is me and Otter in Low Hall at Buckton Hall. This was not done by for me. This was done, uh, sorry, this is not done by me. It was done for me. It was done by Lord Richard of Salisbury, who in real life or mundane life is a vicar. So he thought it would be funny, seeing as I'm a source of all evil, to put a portrait of me kneeling at the feet of a saint. And this is an order that was given for teaching. And it's the order of the saint, either the order of Saint Hild or the order of the Blessed Hild is the formal name for it. So that's Saint Hild. And it's a be you can see how be what beautiful work he does. It's really gorgeous. And I'm very, very privileged to both be a member of the Hild and to have something that glorious. This is me. The blue thing is my chair. Uh, that Actually, that's a thing I also had to do. I could no longer use my longbow because the hand shock dislocated my wrist. So I switched to uh, this little double recurve that you can see which is an SKB Samic, it's laminate. So it is wood, but it also has some fiberglass components and different kinds of wood and fiberglass. But it, since it's a double recurve, it doesn't stack, which means I can pull back as far as I need to. And, I, and the weight doesn't get more on my fingers. It also means that it's got more thrust than either a longbow or a single recurve. So when I'm shooting, I have as much penetration into a target, into armor, whatever you want, um, as a 50 or 60 pound longbow. And mine is only 30 pounds. And it's very light in the hand. It really is. It weighs nothing because I can't hold a weight out at, the, at arm's length. But archery is, there's only one thing that can really get me off the archery field, and that's if somebody has started a gaming den. <laughs> <laughs> so it's one of your big loves. It is. This is, I was talking about the Blagard shoot. This is a Blagard target. Oops. Sorry, Sarah. That's right. This is a Blagard target, and that is my arrow in the center, black heart. <laughs> This is a 
personal thank you from oh, where is that that's a thorn oh that's right um for from a, a monarch to a man who was very very useful to him he was personal herald he was chamberlain all sorts of things i love bestiaries i love anything weird funky and kind of monstrous so this is like me um so this is a griffin and a, a horse with attitude deciding that he's going to take on the griffin and i love it very much and and, and use his flat plant eating teeth to attack exactly <laughs> Mistress Michelle in Atlantia started a project where all the scribes she knew did seafaring or oceanfaring illuminations, and they were put in a book, and they're now in the Brooklyn, Li Brooklyn Library in Whitway in the East. I love Luttrell. Normally, this was a whole right-hand side border but I figured he looked kind of fishy. Um, and I, I really love it. And the, the cape came out absolutely perfectly. So I'm very proud of this, really. The, the head is at the wrong angle, but hey. It, it looks very good to me. <laughs> this is at my twins laureling. I am wearing my sport coronet because I, at that point I did not have a different uh, a full coronet. And that is an A2 sized scroll that was done for my twin. And it is a logic diagram because in mundane life, she is a logician who teaches logic in the Department of Philosophy in Durham University. So it's about, you know, it's, it's poster sized. And is that something you created for her? Dame Leonette created that. This one I've done. Okay. And this one is also a favourite. I do lots of them. It's uh, in the British Library. It's Edgerton Manuscript 1146. And it has very, very realistic and beautiful and simple flower and herb pictures. And I just adapt them. That's basically a four sized, a little bit bigger, not much. Real gold. And it's on pergamonata, which is a vellum substitute made out of plants. So it's not actually skin, but it has a lot of the look and the feel of real vellum. And are you able to, have you been able to go and, and handle and, and look at that manuscript? Yes, I am a reader at the British Library. I have handled every single medieval heraldic scroll they have, including the Deering Roll. This is Caliban. He's from the Sforza Hours. He's a little demon that I adapted and fell in love with because he came out really well in the painting for me anyway. And I, it was hard for me to part with him, but I did eventually, he, I believe he went to somebody with, a, with an AOA in the East Kingdom. But yes, I had a lot of fun. I, as I said, I love, I love the grotesque, the evil and the misshapen. Uh, they find a home with me. This was a barony and the accompanying one um, for Umberto Lodovico Scorari, who was Principal Harold after me and who was also, a, and the, he and his wife were the most instrumental people in founding Manith Gwyn, the Welsh Shire. So when I saw their baronies on the backlog, I said, may I do them, please? And this one turned out very, very well. It was my first time drawing Pooty, and they're recognizable as Pooty, so I'm happy with that. Those are the Drachenwald arms. Let us say no more about them. <laughs> um, and as I said later, he's an Italian, so this is a 16th century Italian exemplar. This is for a 15th century Englishman. The Lindquistring, which is the little round drag dragon holding the red gem, is the Kingdom Award for Service. 
And this was done for a man who has literally recreated with his wife the actual encampment of a 15th century, I believe he was a sheriff. And this is Baron Matthew Baker. And I was really pleased with how that dragon came out. Uh, I think it was excellent and I'm still proud of that really. Bestiary. That's all gold and uh, actually I can't tell if that's gold or, or shell gold in the background, but it's a fox. One of the Insulae Draconis awards for martial prowess is called the fox. And this is for my friend Fina. What's the significance of the pigeon among the, are they geese? Um, it's just, I literally copied, I made the one a wood pigeon. The fox is said to lie on its back and, pray, and play dead. And then when all the birds come to start pecking out the eyes and things, then it reanimates itself and grabs one. Uh, hence the very surprised looking pigeon in the lower, <laughs> in the lower panel. This was a blank I made. It's 15th century, it's got grotesques. I was happy, it's an initial U. The center was left bank, blank for a badge or some arms. And that is, as you can see from the shine, that is absolutely, definitely real gold. I use double thick transfer leaf. I use transfer leaf because it, life is too short for me to wrestle with loose leaf, to be honest. Um, I have enough trouble with my breathing without having to not breathe while I'm laying gold. <laughs> This is an award for service. Again, it, it's by Columna. It's copied from, I can't remember the original manuscript, but it, it was by Columna and that is an exact copy, pretty much to, to scale of the border. And that was, it's really hard to draw the same thing about 20 times, but I managed it. This is an early Celtic A, and I just like the geese, they're fun. <laughs> they are fun. I like the bright colors too. Yes. As, as Doran once told me, the most period colors, especially for Celtic, are ketchup, mustard, and relish, red, yellow, and green. <laughs> so this is me in a 13th century hall. I'm just going to keep rubbing that in because Drachenwald's great. Um, <laughs> I'm wearing a shell because it's a pilgrimage. It's in Winchester, which is the home of St. Swithin's Shrine. And earlier that day, I had actually walked the last mile of the pilgrimage route with the people from the event and gone to the cathedral and paid homage. Here I am explaining, oh look, it's even this mug. Um, here I am explaining what I'm doing. I'm trying to uh, create a very large Celtic knighthood scroll there. And, um, my pilgrim script is in the front. It's not the best picture of me, but hey, I wear curtles a lot, as you can see. And is he a visitor? Are you doing yes, a demo? He's a, he's a visitor from the public. It's not a very well-known tourist trap, so they don't close it for us. And same with Raglan, actually. They, we don't put on a show for them, so we're not like most reenactors. Re we just do our stuff and they watch. But he asked a question and I was explaining it. This is myself, my twin, and her husband. I'm the one on the left with the hat. She's the one with the coronet. Um, so yes, I am not actually taller than my brother-in-law, but he doesn't think that. <laughs> <laughs> this is was done for me by Margareta. When I was Signet, I had so many people from the wider kingdom. And remember, we go from Iceland out to Moscow and down to South Africa. I had so many people outside uh, the UK and Ireland working for me that I asked for the principality to award its servants, service award to the scribes who did that. And fortunately, the premier of the award and the prince and princess agreed. So I was able to 
extend that courtesy to them. This one was done for me. This is for my archery. And it was done by a woman who has done so many scrolls that she was well worthy and was the first person to receive the Fried, which is the service award. This was done for Lady Kira, who was leaving us again, a link with string. Again, same, pretty much the same dragon as for Baron Matthew, to be honest. Um, this is the arms of Michelino da Basozzo, which is lots of fun. And her favorite colors were purple and green. So that was kind of kismet. <laughs> it's just beautiful. Is, is the um, population of Dragonfall pretty tran transient? Do, they, do people come and go a lot? It depends where you are. We're mostly, we mostly don't have the American military anymore. So we do have some, but all of the shires that ha were founded by American military have migrated to centers of population that aren't uh, an Air Force base. This is a Latrell one. Is this Richards? I believe it, yes. And this is Richard Rampant, his registered name is Richard Cockshanks, and I thought if I couldn't give the monkey flasher to him, I couldn't give him to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I did the calligraphy here, I did not do the illumination. The illumination is by Baron Paul O'Brien, who is in Klakavirki, which is in Iceland, and his white work here is outstanding. It was one of the first ones I did with uh, a gothic hand, so it's not too bad considering how early it was. Yeah, yeah I, I pulled it because the white wood flowers were so... Um, yes, it's absolutely wonderful. Stunning. Good job. This is just a blank I made. I liked it. Um, I nearly ruined it, and I don't think you can tell, so I was proud of that. <laughs> this is Raglan, the summer estate, or as we call it, home. I am in the purple and blue. I am wearing my heraldry. And we actually shoot from the embrasure of the castle down onto the archery range. So yes, we're shooting from the windows of the castle and that's a, a regular shoot every year. And you can see, um, I believe, I can't remember who that is. It might be Mathilde, but you can see that the children do it as well. As I explain, um, normally if there's a, a child, we ask the parent to hold on to them so that if the child goes out, the parent falls out the window too. This is called health and safety. I did not do the seal on this, but I did everything else. This is a barony, I believe. That was, uh, I did for the same man I did the griffin for, actually, the griffin and the horse. I had gotten much better at my calligraphy by then. And doing the lozenge field was a P-I-T-A. Um, in fact, apparently his first thought when he saw it was, oh my God, who attempted the heraldry? <laughs> This is for Baroness Rianwen, who is the wife of Umberto, who you saw the barony for. This, I think, is my best illumination ever. It looks exactly like the original, exactly, which is in the Oxford, it's in the Bodleian Library, which is the Oxford University Library. Mm. And unfortunately, I ruined the hand. So the best thing I could do was make it consistently ruined so that it was harder to tell. <laughs> this is a secret scribe thing. If you do it wrong, go on, carry on, do it wrong and nobody will notice. <laughs> this is me wearing, again, my heraldry. I have a lot of different ones. I love shooting. This was the first event at which I shot seated. I shot two mastery scores, but I also shot a tree. 
and I just missed completely the boss. It were foam, and I heard this sort of loud thwack and cracking noise, and I'm like, oh, I've lost that arrow. I mean, I. I hope I haven't killed the tree. And I walk around and I had shot this branch clean off the, the lower tree. Um, and since if you shoot it, you eat it, I retrieved it and gave it to the cooks. <laughs> this was the first time I was fought for in Coronet. The woman in the crown which is an, uh, a medieval crown, not actually a reproduction. We have a very fine jeweler, Johanna Lawrence, who does actual gold crowns. Since we're twins and nobody can tell us apart, we had it, first of all, you'll notice she's on the left, which is in dancing called improper. So Ariane always goes on the left because Ariane is always improper. And we switched places. So I heralded them in and started listing off my awards. And then when I got to the fox, I went, wait, wait, you don't have a fox. And we did a sort of um, shtick number where we tried to reverse places and kept bumping each other into each other. And finally she did the heralding and I was fought for and everything was right in the end. This was my barony. I had just heralded two courts and the, chain, the, the end of one prince's reign, the beginning of another prince's reign. And they called me in by saying things like all my low pursuits and that's Duchess Isabel there or as queen as she was and King Vitus behind her. The saying is I was barrened for the height of low behavior. <laughs> but I had no clue it was coming at all. And so I was very, very moved and I knelt. The, the blue blur down in the lower right corner is my chair, but I figured if they're, they're going to do this for me, I can get off the chair for once. So when you get called up in court, um, do you take the chair up with you so that you can- I do. In this, in this, in this particular instance, um, I was already in court because I was heralding for the prince and princess. So I just, I'm the Baroness of Schick. I sort of kept seated, then bent over like a snail and brought myself with my chair still seated over, over, <laughs> over to them. This is the same event, but uh, a scroll I did for a Master of Defence, a very early Master of Defence, mm -hmm. but Alexandre Le, um, Le Roi d'Avignon. And it's a Michelino de Pesozzo with a seraphim that I stole from a different manuscript. And you can't see the... You can't see the three rapiers because they're in gold on purple and wavy back, a uh, wavy purple and white background, which is uh, echoing his personal heraldry. I should, because it would have been horrible and thus wonderful, have made the rapiers bright green, but I put the gesso down before I realized what I was doing. <laughs> Tinctureless, expect heralds to use it against you. <laughs> This is Raglan. It's uh, just one of the court pictures I took. So see, this is a court. <laughs> wow. This is at a Tudor Welsh place just down the road from Raglan called Tretower. And that is then Prince Yannick and uh, his 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 lady consort, lady princess, and me. Obviously, I've just released an arrow, and I'm making the face like, please don't let anything go wrong when I'm using this weapon. <laughs> I mentioned gaming earlier. This is a game that Master Duncan Carr brought to my attention called von Strasbourg Tarot. It is still played pretty exclusively in Austria, although they're, they're nuts for it over there, I'm told. And he handed me, he got me off the archery range. He handed me the rules. It was, it was getting dark, so I wasn't going to play that night. I read the rules and thought I'd take, taken some painkillers, maybe a few too many. No, they were just that random. Um, 
this is a game you have to play in order to get to get the sense of it and the way it does. The only person who has ever gotten immediately is the chap in the lower right in the party colored red and green who is my apprentice and is able to get all kinds of rule systems very quickly. Oh, that's the stress. <laughs> this is me heralding. Right before I'm called in for an award of myself, again, they blindsided me. That was, I'm trying to remember who's, who did that scroll. I believe Lord Richard of Salisbury, who did my hills, did that one as well. This is Raglan, this is home. This is the picture that was on the front of the tournaments illuminated, I believe. And that's down by the, the, the dry moat. There's a dry moat. You can see the niches in the wall where the statues used to be. Um, the sort of red areas, yeah, those. And then the under, underneath the bridge goes up to the main area. This is Mistress Leah. I took this picture. It is not me. Um, she is a very industrious and very talented a seamstress. I, I am neither an industrious nor a talented seamstress. <laughs> I, I love the framing on this picture. I love that you can see the little baby legs back here. <laughs> and it just, it's, it's perfectly period. It's just lovely. This is one, I believe that's Lady Agnes. Oh, Oops, sorry. Sorry. Who sorry. is, has done wonders for fighting and particularly for bringing women into fighting. Fighting my shire's champion, Johannes of Uffingdon, who is very, very shiny. You cannot see how shiny his queer ass is, but I assure you it is the shiniest thing you have ever seen. The chap with the pelican cap on is being pelicaned. That is Richard Rampant, who I did the flasher monkey for. That is me looking uncommonly dressed up. Um, the inside of that hat, I was let see, has pirates on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's red and ermine, but on the inside there are pirates in it. And that's at Ingestry, which I've mentioned, which is adapted for, for the disabled. <laughs> If you remember the blue and orange 25 slides ago, Lady Hazel is very reticent. She doesn't like being called up in court. So the way the prince and princess gave her this award was to make it make the scroll, well, take the image of the scroll and put it on a plate, cover the plate in cake and ask her to say, serve the cake. And the scroll was being revealed as each piece of cake came off and eventually I was called over to read it to her. So that was a, a particularly wonderful and, and, and pretty successful piece of e evil there. That's fantastic. I love that. This is me looking as if I have no spoons <laughs> with Prince Visa. Spoons, there's a, if you go on butyoudontlooksick.com, there is an article called Spoon Theory, which explains rationing and uh, rationing out energy and pacing for the usually invisibly disabled, but also visibly disabled. Uh, it's a it's a term that we use uh, pretty regularly around my house. <laughs> it just some days you just run out. Yep. Um, they really framed me and my twin. This is right before her laureling. Um, they told me as Signet that she was being laureled. They told her as a herald that I was being laureled. We didn't know each other. And because we love each other so much, we were just happy to know that the other twin was finally being recognized. <laughs> so we got all of these plots. Um, I had... It was set up as a medieval scholarly debate where she was espousing the forces of good and I was espousing the forces of evil, which as you can see, 
evil has cookies. And that was the main thrust of my of my argument was that uh, we have more fun and we have cookies. It's the best way to lure people over to the dark side. That's just me trying to show off the fact that I've got a laurel. That's again Raglan in the background in the in the canvas canvas camp. This is me heralding a accession. Uh, my my herald, my apprentice and his lady have just won coronet, and they are being handed the crown. And that's back at the beginning. Okay, so we'll stop. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention um, when you talked about uh, taking your chair into court, one of the things that some of our local groups are doing is uh, uh, one of our local woodworkers has uh, started making a um, kind of a sitting bench to have in court for people who need that kind of accommodation. Um, and That's good. Yeah, I think it's a really great idea and I hope to see um, more and more uh, kingdoms adopt it. Yes, it, it really is a help. And the royals are generally very good if you just sort of say, you know me, I can't kneel or you know me, I, I can't stand. Yeah. Um, do you mind? Do you mind if I just sit on the floor? I can't kneel. My knees will go to the next shire, um, and they're very good with that. There's a lot of understanding, and these people take excellent care of me. So that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Um, is there anything that we haven't covered that you wanted to talk about today? Not that I can think of, but I have long COVID, and occasionally the bottom falls out of my brain. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It's an actual physical sensation. It's really, it's like Bombay's door, oh, Bombay door open and the brain just goes boom. Oh, that's awful. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's all right. Uh, it'll go eventually. I'm being treated. Everything's fine. Nothing is ruined. Well, that's a good, a good attitude to have. Um, as, as we, um, well, I don't know, where, where is Drakenbald in getting back to playing? Sorry? Where, where is your kingdom in getting back to uh, having events? Uh, we've just, we, we're starting to cancel the summer events. Um, the problem we're having is not individual countries. It's the fact that we can't hold a crown in Germany and let people from Sweden and the UK come and vice versa. There are so many borders that get crossed and that are restricted. Um, and of course, the UK has had its special moment of leaving Europe, so that makes it even harder. And um, so, yeah, it's so many, so, so many different quarantines and legal legal requirements that we just haven't had anything. The last thing I did was a coronet tourney that Viscount Yannick did me proud at, and that was a year ago, February. Right. And that was the, I think that was the last event that was held. Well. In, in the meat, in the flesh anyway. Right, right. It's the same for us. We span um, Canada and, and part of the US and uh, we won't be having events until the border can open, right? Because you can't have a kingdom event with only part of the kingdom. So it just doesn't work that way. Um, We're okay. hoping that we'll get to Raglan today. Today? Not today. This year. This year. <laughs> what, Different what, adverb. What month uh, is Raglan usually held in? August. In August. So there are three big camping events in Drakenwald. Um, one in Sweden, one in Finland, and then Raglan in Wales. And I went to the one in Finland, which is Kajal, which is colloquially referred to as the Piers Holiday because you find peers walking around in 90 degree heat in just their underwear. And that's just the kind of event it is. Party in the sauna, that kind of thing. I love it. I've heard great things about that event. Yeah. Um, so how do you see things opening up in your kingdom? Um, what kind of changes do you expect to be happening? We've got a DEI uh, committee being formed. I was on the in informal committee um, when it started being an issue uh, and we're trying to make it a accessibility. It should be a legal requirement. 
and the cooks are wonderful. They adapt themselves. But in the event, in the event we get somebody very unusual and uncooperative or something, we want to have the recourse for, no, no you're not allowed to serve what will kill the person allergic to it, that yeah. kind of thing. But people are just so wonderful that they, they, you know, they carry my stuff. If I'm carrying my stuff and I'm like, no, I'm fine. They're like, no, you're not fine. You lie when you say you're fine. Give me the chair. <laughs> Um, yeah, and, and hopefully you, when we reopen, it will be with a much greater awareness of myself and the several people who have just joined who also have my disability. Um, I, I hope so. I hope that, um, that this has really given us time to um, look inwards a little bit and to, to, to realize that there are some really easy things that we can do to help um, cater to people and and our population is age, aging as well um, one of the the events that we had um, the year before we shut down um, sport of kings the uh, uh, event steward um, put uh, respite benches all around site uh, because it's a lot of walking and so there were benches kind of strategically located for people who can't walk those distances without resting and that that was a really big help and it was a really um, insightful thing to do accessibility wise so I, I think small steps are happening yes and as I said most people I've never had an issue where there hasn't been something I can eat at a feast and all, all this the things that you might take for granted but are just so incredibly special. And that's really what the SCA is, people who will go that extra mile. Um, you know, people who will carry not only my chair, they'll stop carrying other people's chairs to carry my chair. Um, they'll take my suitcases. I take my suitcase to my room. It's a, it has wheels, I can do it. No, 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 I will take the suitcase. Um, just the outstanding love and courtesy that I'm shown is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. We, we love our family. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> well, thank you so much for spending your time with me this evening. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's my pleasure, absolutely. Um, I am having a moment where my brain just left <laughs> and I can't remember who we're interviewing. Oh, I remember who we're interviewing. Uh, Tuesday, I am interviewing uh, Pasha uh, for Branch of Laurels, and she is a um, bardic laurel. She has an incredible voice. She's a singer. Um, and then Wednesday, we are um, interviewing Isolt from the Principality of the Summits. She is an English teacher, mundanely, who has brought a lot of her students into the SCA over decades. Um, it was a university professor who brought me in, so. <laughs> so um, both of those will be really interesting interviews. This has been really wonderful. I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And remember, Team Evil has cookies. <laughs> they are the best. <laughs> Thanks everyone for watching. Thanks. We'll see you soon. Bye.